afternoon everyone you're live in my kitchen uh welcome Ian's here we're going to talk about um shoulder matching today um nice light topic um, i'm just going to make my tea beautiful day sunny i've got a bright orange shirt on it's very sunny outside right um hope everyone's well yeah we'll do a bit of uh, stakeholder management and um I'm, I'm probably a little bit a week bit a little bit behind about a week behind probably but um i'm going to talk about stakeholder management and we're going to think about it in um well, it was really hot news event last week um the european super league which i'm sure we've probably heard about um but uh that's what i thought we'd do um not much, Jim. i did ask a football question last week actually but i'm going to ask another one because this is about the european super league if anybody can get it Sorry, my laptop's uh, beeping, if you can hear that. I'm really sorry. It's telling me I've got to do tier three. Um, anyway, I've got a question. Because I'm going to do stakeholder management and link it to the European Super League and try and find out why perhaps it went wrong, I've got a question about football, but anybody can have a guess. So it's a nice, easy question. It's what is the average salary of a Manchester City player? Uh, Manchester City, um, if you don't know, very good team in England. Probably the best. My laptop's having one um so what's their average salary in pounds sterling per year the average man city player and that that's the 23 players i think it's named in the squad there's various things um can you double that up by 52 please jim um so i want it annually <laughs> um so 52 times 300 that is isn't it what's your maths like jim get the calculator out um 10 is 3 million, isn't it? 15 million. Wow, that's 15.6 million you're going for. The average salary, Jen. Wow. 15.6 million. Mahim's gone 3 million. Okay. So we'll see if anybody else has a guess. But um, that's what we've got. Um, average man city salary. Anyway, so we're going to talk about stakeholder management. And um, project management is not my hot topic. Uh, but stakeholder management is quite interesting. I've done, yeah, I've done a crofty. You, you're kind of pretty close to the top earning player, actually. Um, you're, you're kind of right up there on the top earning player, but there's some, <laughs> but there's some who don't earn quite that much. But you're pretty close to the top earner, I think. Uh, actually, I don't even think the top earners on that actually, Jim. Um, but you might be. I can't remember now. Um, I've been googling like a lunatic. Anyway, um, so stakeholder management, and what I'm going to do is. <laughs> <laughs> I should mean you wouldn't be happy with half of that, Mahim, yeah. but you just sell for a quarter like the rest of us, mate. That's uh, <laughs> yeah, just sell for the quarter. So what I'm going to do with stakeholder management is look at it like what went wrong with the European Super League because that's just like a project that they were trying to get off the ground. And for me, I don't think they manage their stakeholders very well. That was the big thing. Now the big thing about stakeholder management, whenever you're trying to roll something new out and you project. Get your stakeholders involved. Now, there's something that probably quite a lot of people have seen called a, the stakeholder grid, stakeholder management grid. And um, like most of the things in learning and development, is this one's in a four-box grid. I forgot to say, I've got a, a nice biscuit, a Demerara sugar shortcake, shortbread. We bought these for my birthday last week. They're very nice. Very, very sweet, which is never going to go down a miss with me. But, yeah, so classic four-box grid, and it's based on power and interest. So you've got people who've got low power and low interest. You've got some people who've got high power, low in, low interest. And obviously, you've got some people high interest, low power and high power, high interest. So classic four box grid. Now, mapped into those boxes, there's classic ways that you manage those people. So this is the people that you have got low power and low interest in your project. You just monitor those people. The people who've got high level of interest, but low level of power, <laughs> then, um, then you keep those people in full. Um, up the top there, where you've got high level of power, but low level of interest, you keep those people satisfied. And then the high power, high interest people, you engage and consult and you actively involve. Yeah. And now that that's great. I get that. I understand the grid and I understand the boxes and I monitor these people and I keep these people informed. But the, the grid is only as good as what is put into it. And my belief around stakeholder management in the European Super League 
is they massively, massively misplaced people in the grid. Now, the owners of the football clubs, very rich, very wealthy. And often what we see is, is the hierarchical people are often placed with the highest level of power. Now, they have power because they have money. But what was massively, massively underestimated in the, uh, in the European Super League was the power of the fans and the players. Now, they weren't perceived, I don't believe, as people with power. I think some of them weren't even perceived as interested. I think the players in particular were seen as people who, who would just play wherever they were told to play. Now, football players generally, um, and one of them actually said, um, we're football fans first. We just happen to enjoy playing football and be very good at it. But what they actually believe is that they're just a fan first. Now, of course, the fans as well kind of mobilised and they had a huge level of power. Um, the joys of social media helped change that thing. But the only people I believe the organisers of the European Super League had put into the high power, high interest box was themselves. They would said, yeah, we're really important and we're really interested. We have all the money and therefore we can go there. Yeah, they would actually care about their fan power and respond. I don't think they even thought about it personally. I don't even think they considered, because I think they, they thought in the UK or in England in particular, there's only like 50,000 fans get to a game or something like that. And we've got another 5 million fans in wherever, Saudi Arabia or wherever. It doesn't really matter. So those people won't mind where they're playing. But the power of the fans and indeed some of the players um, was quite an interesting challenge. Now. It got me thinking about stakeholder management and has this happened before? And um, I'm aware that not everybody's going to be excited about football. So it reminded me of something that was on TV quite a long time ago, which was um, Jamie's School Dinners. Um, and some people might remember that programme where Jamie Oliver was trying to get children to eat slightly better food at school. And so you start thinking about who are my key stakeholders there? And of course, you know, you've kind of got the school kids, you've got the parents, you've got the government, you've got local government, um, you've got head teachers, you've got the school cooks. All of those people are stakeholders. And it's easy to say, well, OK, the government, high power, high interest. The government must be high power, high interest. Well, well really, actually, probably quite interested. And the government are going to say, yeah, we want to feed our children healthily, kind of get that. But power well what you find is a lot of school budgets are completely devolved um like often a head teacher manages all of the money and so what oliver did was he actually thought about his stakeholder management in my opinion and started thinking so what so where do the people go and one of the things he did was he invited a, a, a group of head teachers to one of his restaurants um 15 in, in central london and he said, oh, thanks for coming. You know, I want to talk about ideas to improve the healthy eating of kids, blah, blah, blah. And uh, he said, but before we start talking about that, I want everyone to have some food. You know? I want everybody to have a bit of dinner. And um, so he fed them food. And he said, oh, you know, well, we'll get cracking now. But did you enjoy your meal? And everybody went, oh, it's amazing food. It's really lovely. Oh, so, so. And he said, well, that meal cost as much as a school dinner. Now, this is effective stakeholder management. Yes, he went and spoke to the government. Yes, he went and spoke to local government. The key stakeholder was about the head teacher. There's others as well. He's got to get the cooks involved because um, he wants them to cook the right food. Um, one of the challenges he's had was probably parents. There's a story about a parent like putting fast food through the school gates because they, they didn't want their kid not to eat chicken dinosaurs or whatever they were. Um, so there's things like that. And then even if I bring stakeholder management back closer to home, remember, it's all about power and interest, the power interest grid. But it's where we plot them. Now, even let's think about something like a wedding, as simple as a wedding. Now, think about that, because that's a project. So think about like a bridesmaid. Now, where do we naturally plot that person? You know, when we think, do we monitor them? Do we keep them informed? Do we keep them satisfied? Or do we engage and consult? Often the, bri the bridesmaid is hugely involved. I'm just using the bridesmaid as an example, could be the best man. Um, but they're hugely involved. Now, if we think about the entertainment in the evening, uh, maybe a band or a singer or whatever, a magician or whatever you have, those people are often just booked with an email and then left. Now, if the bridesmaid isn't at the wedding, 
the wedding will still go off absolutely perfectly. It'll be fine. Be very disappointing and all that kind of stuff, but actually not a problem. But the evening reception, <laughs> if, if the entertainment's not there, it'd be far more damaging. The wedding will still happen, but the whole day could be broken a little bit. Now, it's interesting, again, where, where do we place these stakeholders in the grid? And that's the important thing. Um, so if you are managing a project and you're doing a stakeholder analysis, don't do it on your own. Don't just try and do something on your own because you will see it through, through quite a, a slim lens, really. Um, so get other people involved. Of course, what it won't do is it won't show the attitude of stakeholders because some people do have a lot of power and they should be interested, but they just can't be bothered. So it won't always show that on stakeholder analysis. And there's four simple steps there, stakeholder mapping. It's about identifying your stakeholder. Then you have to analyze them. Now, when you're identifying, the more people you can get involved, you can learn from the past, learn from previous projects. Interesting, will the European Super League do that? Did they learn from how the Premier League was set up? I don't believe they did. Um, I can forward think and think what, what might we want to do going forward. Um, you want different opinions to stop things like unconscious bias coming in. Um, it could be job titles that you're attracted to. It could be different genders. It could be different backgrounds. Anything along those lines. So in that identification period, you want diverse thoughts. One, to stop um, unconscious bias creeping in but also the, f the fact that you're going to get that good mix of stakeholders. The analysis is about what their willingness is and how necessary are they to it? Um, what's their value going to be? And then finally, we map them into that grid. Um, once they're in the box, of course, we've still got to prioritise because you put everybody in one box, you've still got to, you can still got to manage them different. So everybody's different within the box. But I think we can just sometimes get that a little bit wrong. So for me, I love the stakeholder grid. I, I have no problem with it. The effort has to be with, are we getting the right people in the right box? I don't be, believe those guys in charge of the ESL had a diverse enough group to manage the stakeholders. They didn't think about the level of interest that people had, which could translate into a higher level of power if they were mobilised. Will they learn? Which is one of the things about identification of um, stakeholders. Um, I don't think it's the end of it. But it's worth thinking for us, projects and personal projects as well. Right, so going back, what is the average salary of that Man City player? You Google it, there's a couple of figures, but I went off one I found. And um, quite disturbingly, the average Man City player gets paid just over 5.8 million a year. That's for all 23 in the first team squad. Um, so 5.8 million. So um, thank you very much for joining me today. Number 62, I had a great time. I hope to see you next week. Um, let's hope the sun's still shining. After bank, enjoy your bank holiday, everyone, and I'll see you soon. Thanks a lot. Frightening, Gemma. <laughs>